Good morning, soon to be afternoon, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask our guests here in house if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been silenced as we prepare to begin. That is always appreciated. And of course, for those watching online now and in the future, we're glad to receive your questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And of course, we will post the program later today on the website for everyone's future reference as well. Hosting our discussion and introducing our special guest is Hella Dale, Senior Fellow for Public Diplomacy in our Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. She works on U.S. government institution and programs for strategic outreach to the public of foreign countries, as well as more traditional diplomatic efforts. Since 1995, many are familiar with her weekly foreign affairs column. She has also been featured in numerous major media outlets. She is a fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and also serves on the Board of Visitors of the Institute on Political Journalism at Georgetown. Please join me in welcoming Hella Dale. Hella. Thank you, John, and good afternoon. I think it must be by now, almost. And welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Um, we are here today to explore a subject that could not be timelier. On Saturday, on Halloween of all days, the State Department released a large batch of Benghazi-related emails. It included one from the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli a few days after the September 11, 2012 attacks, which stated to State Department officials that would they please stop blaming the uh, video, the anti-Muslim video, on the Benghazi attacks. This message, of course, was completely ignored. Uh, it suggests this large batch that we now have before us, that there is still a lot of information that we have not received in the public and in Congress relating to the Benghazi attack. Uh, that attack on the diplomatic Benghazi facility cost four Americans their lives. It has been an outrage for many of us, including here at the Heritage Foundation, that we have not received all the answers that we need and deserve. So we are extremely pleased to have with us here today um, the Honorable Pete Hoekstra, former congressman from Michigan, former chairman of the House Benghazi Select Committee on Intelligence, and the current Shillman Fellow at the Investigative Project on Terrorism. Chairman Hoekstra is here to talk about his new book, which I hope you all had a chance to pick up uh, outside, Architects of Disaster, The Destruction of Lib Libya. The book provides much needed context for the policy failures that led to Benghazi, something that I personally, and I've written about this ever since it happened, have been looking for um, in the various reports and books that have been published. Um, as a result of this policy disaster, we have lost tremendous ground in Libya. It is today a mess. It is a breeding ground for terrorism, and yet it could have been prevented. So I can't wait to hear what Chairman Hoxha has to tell us today. And after he has spoken, we will have some time for questions and answers and lunch outside. Great. Thank you. You're so welcome. Great. Thank you. And, it, uh, and thanks to Heritage. It's always good to be. Uh, it's always good to be back at Heritage and be talking about the various issues and talking to one of uh, the. Uh, I worked here for a period of time, talking to one of my former colleagues. It's it's nice to know that uh, on the education front, uh, 14 years after Heritage and myself and others fought No Child Left Behind, uh, we can now claim victory in that. 80% uh, of our Republican colleagues on, on, the, on the Hill are now voting for things like A-plus to roll back, all of those types of things. But today, we're here to talk about uh, an area that, and I never had anything to do with the Benghazi Committee. I was not chairman of the select committee of the Benghazi uh, on Benghazi. Uh, I was, but you know a bit about intelligence. But I, uh, I did have the opportunity to serve 
uh, 10 years on the Intelligence Committee, and I had the opportunity uh, to spend six and a half years as either the, uh, uh, the chairman of the committee or the ranking Republican on the committee, uh, which enabled me to be part of what they call the Gang of Eight, uh, eight people in the House and the Senate uh, who received the most sensitive briefings uh, from the administration on policy and activities in the intelligence community. Uh, sometimes that sounds a whole lot better than what it really is, and, uh, but uh, there were some unique times. I decided to write a book on Libya. So why, you know, why write on Libya? Uh, because I had some unique experiences uh, with Libya. I got on the Intelligence Committee of January 2001, uh, dabbled in intelligence for a period of time. I was also on the, the Budget Committee. I was on the Transportation Committee. Uh, and then 9-11 happened. Uh, and after 9-11, I spent uh, probably 80 to 90 percent of the time that I had in Washington, uh, I spent it working on intelligence issues. Uh, the time in Washington was probably, the time that I was not in Washington uh, was probably evenly split beti between time back in my congressional district or time overseas. And the, uh, those nine years where I was that focused on intelligence, uh, I had the opportunity to go visit uh, uh, 84 different countries. So, uh, uh, and, and when you visit 84 countries, it makes you an expert of none of them. Uh, but it does give you a global perspective of the, type, the types of challenges and the types of issues that you are facing uh, and that we as a country are facing. But in 2003, I'm on the House floor. One of my, I'm, I'm still a, a more junior member on the Intelligence Committee, uh, and one of my colleagues comes up to me and says, hey, Pete, do you want to go to Libya with me? And it kind of reminds me of the day that I was back in my congressional district uh, in 1997, and I got a call from Newt Gingrich, and he said, hey, Pete, uh, you're going to do a press conference this afternoon because you're going to be, uh, you're going to, we're going to put in place a special committee, and you're going to investigate the Teamsters. Uh, and that was in the days when, you know, if you had a cell phone or a mobile phone, it had a big box in your car, and, and you know, there wasn't very good connection. I said, no, Newt, I think we've got a bad connection. It's August. I'll talk to you when I get back in September. Uh, I like my knees. I don't know anything about the Teamsters, uh, and I'm not going to investigate the Teamsters. Uh, two years later, we got done with the investigation of the Teamsters. I could still walk and actually had a great, great relationship with the uh, the leadership of the Teamsters because we rid them of corruption. So now I get this invitation from uh, Sherry Bullard and says, do you want to go see Gaddafi? And <laughs> says, no. Uh, you know, and it's like, no, the administration wants us to go. Uh, they've been getting some outreach from the regime in Libya that Gaddafi's maybe thinking of uh, he wants to talk to the United States, and we think that uh, maybe a, a couple of Codells going over and actually entering, interacting with Gaddafi would be a positive thing to kind of give us a read before we do anything from an, administrative, an, an administration standpoint. Uh, so we find ourselves uh, on our way to meet with Gaddafi. Uh, in my next book, you can read about all the details, how we were there for we landed uh, in Libya, uh, we drove around the desert, we went to uh, the Mediterranean, and I'm from Michigan, and I'm looking at this wide expanse of beach and thinking, wow, this is going to go for $10,000 a foot uh, lakefront, uh, kind of like what it does if you want to buy lakefront property in Michigan, and there's nothing there. Uh, it's kind of like I need to get a land deal before I leave or at least buy a lot for Diane and I so that uh, if this place ever turns around, uh, we can build a nice home on the Met. But uh, so finally we get an opportunity to meet with Gaddafi. We're driving down the road and in front of us there is a huge circus tent, what we would equate to being a circus tent, uh, comes up out of the horizon. And we go in and we go into this tent, and it's Gaddafi, and, and it's, it's four of us there. And we start talking with him, and uh, we have a, everybody says, what's he like? We had a very, very civilized conversation, a rational converse, conversation about the threats uh, that they faced in Libya, the threats that we faced from the re radical jihadist movement and these kinds of things. So we have a very, very positive meeting. Uh, and, you know, we leave and we report back uh, that we think that 
this, this regime, this, uh, this individual in this country, that maybe they're very serious about changing their behavior. And of course, that then flows through a whole series of diplomatic moves uh, and other things. I go back to Libya two more times and meet with Gaddafi on both occasions. Uh, and you know what happens after 2003 is rather, remar is rather remarkable. You have a country that for decades, uh, there's a long litany of terrorist attacks, uh, the discotheque in Berlin. Uh, perhaps most famously, uh, infamously, is the, the takedown of Pan Am 103 uh, over Scotland. Over 200 uh, people are, are killed, uh, and it's directly tied back to Gaddafi and to his regime. And so it's, it's a, re a rather remarkable feat that in 2003, uh, this individual is, is looking like he may be willing to change his behavior. And so, you know, you start testing, and the administration tar starts testing exactly uh, what this means and how far it goes and how we, how we ramp up through that process. And what we find is that, you know, he's, uh, he's willing to do some, make some fundamental changes. He's willing to accept responsibility uh, for some of the previous terrorist attacks. How do we know? Uh, he paid reparations to the victims' families, uh, which is a pretty dramatic step. He's willing to turn over his nuke program. And rather than suspending his nuke program, uh, which is what we've done or supposedly are doing in Iran, and we've come up with a Rube Goldberg scheme of, you know, trying to put in place a set of metrics to measure whether Iran is actually abiding by the agreement. What did Gaddafi do? Well, I talked to Spence Abraham last week uh, because what Gaddafi did is he took his nuke program, he put it in crates, they shipped it to the United States, and Spence Abraham, I think, although he probably can't say it publicly, but he's told me this privately, is that it is in a large warehouse, crated up, <coughs> and it's next to the Ark of the Covenant from Indiana Jones, <laughs> which means that we will never find it, uh, and Gaddafi will never find it again. But the program is gone. There is no measure, in, there's no need for a regimen of monitoring compliance. His program was gone. And then perhaps most importantly, he started developing ties with our intelligence community and our military to fight radical jihadists. And he knew how to fight radical jihadists. He had been fighting the radical jihadist movement for decades. They were the greatest threat to him staying in power. And so he's sharing intelligence with us. He's, sharing, he's talking about military operations. The end result is that by 2009, 2010, we have stabilized northern Africa. Northern Africa is stabilized. It is the access point to get into the soft underbelly of Europe. And you're seeing the reports today. Of, of what's happening. I think there was, uh, you know, uh, I think the Italian Coast Guard just, rep uh, just rescued something like hundreds of people off the northern coast of Libya trying to get into uh, Italy or trying to find a way uh, into southern Europe. But that, that whole area ended up becoming a stable regime, a stable government that was a barrier to people entering in to southern Europe. 2009, 2010, whenever, the Obama administration decided that they were going to change America's approach. And I think this is, this is a lesson that, uh, or an indication that America didn't fully understand was going to happen under this new administration. But the president in 2007 during the campaign basically sent the clear signal. And he sent the, uh, the signal because when he spoke, and I think it's, it's early in the book, and I put it there because I think it defines so much of what this president did. Think about this. I truly believe that the, this is the president in 2007. 
I truly believe that the day I'm inaugurated, not only the country looks at itself differently, but the world looks at America differently. I think it is a naive point of view. It, some would say it might be an arrogant point of view. But the belief that the country would look at itself differently and that the world would look at America differently simply because we had a new president. He then goes on, and it's clear where, where he was sending the message to. <clears throat> if I'm reaching out to the Muslim world, they understand that I've lived in a Muslim country. My sister is half into Indonesia. I traveled there. So basically it's saying, you know, <clears throat> regardless of what previous administrations have done, <clears throat> Libya in 2003, and I, some of you were there, some of you are younger, you weren't there. Um, but in 2003, you'll remember that, and as this Gaddafi thing was starting to evolve, people were saying it's all because, because of Iraq, that he, was, he saw what happened to Saddam Hussein and said, this is not going to happen to me, so I'm going to reach out to the United States. I would argue that it was a consistent bipartisan foreign policy uh, for decades that ostracized him and cut him off from the world community, maybe culminated by what the world community did in Iraq, uh, but that it was a consistent foreign policy uh, of Republicans and Democrats that resulted in Gaddafi's change in behavior. It was not the seminal event of finding Saddam Hussein uh, in a rat hole and pulling him out and then trying him and then executing him. That wasn't it. I think it was a culmination of a long-term U.S. policy. But this president, coming into office, believed that the world would see itself differently, that nation states and radical jihadist groups would view America differently uh, and that they might then change their behavior towards the United States simply because we had a new president. And he started putting that policy into effect. Uh, there's more and more reports coming out about his outreach to Iran early in his presidency and beginning those negotiations very, very early. Uh, the, the public side of that was in 2009 when we had the Green Revolution in Iran, and the president decided more or less to side with the Iranian regime rather than the, with the revolutionaries in the street. Uh, you also saw this in Cairo in 2009 where the president gave his speech uh, and allowed the Muslim Brotherhood and facilitated the Muslim Brotherhood sitting in the front row, sending a very powerful signal uh, to the people of Egypt uh, <clears throat> and to the rest of the world that for the first time uh, the United States might be open uh, to engaging with radical jihadists, the Muslim Brotherhood, probably the spring from which all this radical theology uh, and ideology has flowed from through decades. Uh, and then, again, taking an ally, Mubarak, and sending a clear signal that having him be removed from office, and if there was the Muslim Brotherhood, that might be okay. I, I, I would been in Egypt. I met with uh, Mubarak's regime. I met with Mubarak. And, you know, the amazing thing is, again, Mubarak was someone that had done, when we went into Afghanistan, into Iraq, Mubarak and his administration would, been a, would, be, would have been one of the first ones to say, be careful what you're doing. You don't know what forces you will unleash uh, by going into these places. Very, very insightful and basically telling us, you know, be careful, and they would have said, don't do it. But once we did it, they, asked, they did everything that we asked them to do to support those efforts. But you saw, we've seen what happened with Mubarak. But the clearest case is what happened in Libya. You started seeing the, you know, the flow of, quote, unquote, the Arab Spring move from Tunisia to Egypt and then into Libya. The president and the administration had a decision to make, and they made it. They decided to ally themselves with the individuals and the organizations that were going to overthrow Gaddafi, the insurrection and the rebellion. Early on in this uh, process, they identified, uh, or the intelligence community said, that, you know, there, there are only slight appearances 
slight indications that the people that are the core of this rebellion will have any ties to radical jihadist movements. It was either an immense intelligence failure uh, or it was shaping intelligence to the story that you wanted intelligence to give you. That, you know, the people that are part of this rebellion are actually, uh, are, are actually good people. Embracing democracy, embracing Western values, and once Gaddafi is gone, <coughs> they will, you know, they will usher in a period of, of freedom, democracy, elections, and, and human rights. The people that we were actually assisting, people that we actually ended up training, allying with, people that we provided weapons to, uh, many of them uh, came from the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, LIFG. Who's the LFIG? These are people that have been fighting Gaddafi for years. But they not well, only were fighting Gaddafi. Uh, if you take a look at what went on in Afghanistan, if you take a look at what went on in Iraq, uh, you'll remember that in a lot of these places you would hear about so-and-so al Libby, so-and-so al Libby. And what does that mean? These are people from Libya. Uh, we ended up allying ourselves against Gaddafi with elements of the rat, with many elements of radical jihadists, people who had either recruited or who had actually fought in Afghanistan and Iraq, people who had American blood on their hand, uh, which was a continuation of the policy of this president that the world would see us differently that we could engage with radical jihadist groups, that they viewed America differently, that we could actually manage the outcomes, but most importantly, that we could trust them. I think the, uh, the height of irony going through this whole process is, and I, I don't sit here saying that Gaddafi was a great guy. <clears throat> Gaddafi was, was bad before he became an ally. Uh, he clearly was imperfect as he was an ally. Although the, hum the UN Human Rights Commission came out and said that, you know, there was progress being made, uh, the, in the, the, ease, the one indication was a calculation that he and his sons made. Uh, in the two to three years leading up to the rebellion, they were releasing, I think it's up to 3,000 LFIG, former LI LIFG fighters from the prisons in Libya. Why? He knew it was a risk. Why? Because he believed that he had allied with the U.S. and the U.S. would support him. And so what he found out, like Mubarak, is that allying with the U.S. might not be the best strategy that you could embark on. We've seen the results. I mean, ever since Gaddafi's been overthrown, uh, the, Secretary of, the former Secretary of State recently said in the debate, they, they had an election. It's kind of like, yep, they had an election. Uh, it was the smartest use, or it was a smart, it was the best use of smart power. Um, if that's the best use of smart power, I'd hate to see the worst use of smart power. Uh, you know, Libya has now become uh, and evolved into an exporter of fighters, uh, an exporter of weapons, and an exporter of ideology uh, throughout Northern Africa. Uh, and throughout uh, the Middle East, I personally believe that uh, some of the fighters uh, and the weapons that were used uh, on the night that Benghazi was attacked uh, are fighters affiliated or perhaps actively uh, involved in the overthrow of Gaddafi and that were allied with the United States. Uh, they were trained and equipped by the United States uh, and or NATO. Same thing for the weapons and the fighters that moved over into Syria through Turkey uh, that became the core group of ISIS. Uh, were people that got their roots and some of their additional training and some of their weapons from, uh, from the United States. Libya is now a cesspool. Northern Africa uh, is totally destabilized. Uh, you have two competing governments, uh, two, two groups of people trying to, be, trying to govern Libya as well as parts of the country now being controlled by ISIS. Let me just share a couple of things in terms of of lessons learned, and then we'll open it up for your questions. I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned here. Um, I think the first is 
we had a successful policy in Libya, but we've had a successful policy in other places of the world before. <clears throat> but what you need to have to be successful in foreign policy is you need a consistent, long-term, bipartisan uh, approach to solving some of the most difficult problems that are out there. <clears throat> you cannot take foreign policy uh, and move and change direction significantly from one administration to another. The reason we were successful in Libya is that we had a consistent bipartisan foreign policy for an extended period of time. Gaddafi knew what he could expect from the West, he knew what he could expect from the United States, uh, and he based his behavior on that consistent policy. The second thing is foreign policy you have to view in the long term. Uh, you are naive if you believe that you can change the world uh, overnight or whether you believe that you can significantly change the behavior of the people that uh, are either your friends or are, are against you if you believe that you can do that in a short period of time. You have to look at foreign policy in a context of slowly evolving and uh, achieving your goals. The, um, <clears throat> the third thing is, at least in this war with radical jihadists, we have to finally come to the realization and the recognition of who our enemy is. There is a real enemy out there. They will not change their behavior. It is not America's fault. They despise us for who we are and what we stand for. Uh, and if we don't recognize that, if we don't finally come to the grips that there is uh, and, and define this threat and develop a bipartisan policy that can sustain itself for the next two or three administrations, uh, we are in serious trouble. This is a real threat, uh, and if we don't realize it now, uh, I'm not sure when we will. When you've got a destabilized Northern Africa, when you've got a destabilized Arabian Peninsula, when you've got a destabilized um, Middle East, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like, where, when are we going to get serious about confronting, containing, uh, and ultimately defeating this threat and doing it uh, in a bipartisan basis? And so uh, those are just uh, three of the lessons. There are other lessons that, uh, that we can learn uh, as well. But uh, with that, I will turn it over. I will turn it back to you, and we will go on to the next part. Uh, you know, I, I took a couple of things that, uh, that I, I kind of treasure. I wish I could have, uh, one final note, I wish when I had received these, <clears throat> I wish I would have gotten the autograph. Uh, and, see, and then I could go to Pawn Stars. Uh, and see exactly what these would be worth. One is, uh, they're both written by Gaddafi. Uh, he presented them to me personally. Uh, I was too naive to ask him for his autograph on them. Uh, but one is called Isratine, which is his solution to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Uh, and the other is... Um, and I don't think you can get this uh, at Barnes & Nobles. Uh, you might be able to get it online. Uh, but it's his little green book. Uh, you've maybe heard of his little green book, which has some of the most bizarre statements in it, uh, which, uh, you know, because uh, I think, what was Reagan's quote? Uh, you know, he's kind of strange. And if you read the book, you'll figure out why. <laughs> so, uh, great. Thank you. Okay, well Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. You don't often get to talk to people who have actually sat down with someone like Muammar Gaddafi. Oh. <laughs> um, and I'm sure his, this is poetry. I'm sure it's fascinating. <laughs> it's not poetry. No, it's actually serious <laughs> policy discussion. Um, first, a question for myself, if I could be so bold. Do you see any sign at all in the Obama administration or any, say, anywhere on Capitol Hill that some of those lessons that you are discussing now have, in fact, been taken on board. There seems to be a slight change in Obama administration policy, but I'm not sure. I'd love to yeah, hear your I, take. I, I'm not very optimistic about what's going to happen over the next, uh, uh, over the last 14 months of, of this administration. Uh, you have one of the, uh, the key architects of this foreign policy, uh, you know, campaigning and most likely will be the Democratic nominee for president uh, in the election cycle. So I think for them to dramatically uh, alter or move uh, their foreign policy uh, in a different direction, uh, I, don't, I don't hold out a lot of hope for that. Uh, I hope that, uh, you know, when we, get a, uh, when we get a new administration in, 
that we'll be able to wipe the, the slate clean. I go through the book as well and say, and also admit that I think there were some certain mistakes that were made under the Bush administration. Um, and there were clearly mistakes that were made under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. This is a time for a new president to come in uh, and have a dialogue with Congress and a dialogue with the American people uh, and wipe the slate clean and say, we're now, because when the new president comes in, it'll be, we're almost 16 years past 9-11. Uh, are we safer today than what we were on 9/11? And I think most experts and most and, and most grassroots Americans would say, if I'm looking at the world, the world looks a whole lot more dangerous today than what it does. So let us let's have an honest discussion uh, about what the threat is and what it's going to entail to defeat it, and and hopefully we can we can bring. Uh, the experts in Congress together on an outlining a strategy, uh, and then we can communicate and uh, give the American people a sense of confidence that our leaders in Washington are united uh, in moving forward. And it doesn't mean that you know it's a rigid policy, but mm -hmm. what what happened with engaging radical jihadists is. You know, there in you know, in a lot of the foreign policy, you knew if you had a Republican president, they might be taking foreign policy a little bit in this direction. A Democrat president might be going a little bit more in that direction. But there was kind of a box. We kind of defined the parameters of how we would engage uh, with our allies and how we would engage with our enemies. And so we were relatively predictable, uh, and people knew what to expect. Uh, with the foreign policy of this administration, we blew up the box. Uh, and we've now got to come back and kind of reconfigure it uh, so that uh, Republicans and Democrats can embrace uh, a consistent long-term policy. Okay. Why don't you remain standing? Because yep. I okay. think that you're going to be doing more yeah. talking than I am. Um, we have just uh, another thing here. We have one question from uh, a viewer online asking about um, uh, the role of corporate interests uh, in the uh, Libya policy. Uh, there has been precedent for this in Latin America in the past. Um, she cites the United Fruit in Central America in the 1960s and Dole, Pine Dole Pineapple in Hawaii in the 19 1880s. Mm -hmm. So the question from Mrs. Thor is, were the corporate interests influencing U.S. intervention in Libya? In the in the work that I've done, um, and you know, there's been more of that. That uh, some of that stuff has now uh, generated more attention as more emails have come out. Uh, specifically, I think from some of the e emails uh, regarding uh, from Sidney Blumenthal, yeah. uh, that is bringing that to the forefront. Uh, I don't have any evidence. I didn't really look into that mm -hmm. area. Um, I spent uh, a lot more time looking into it from overall the perspective of what this president's view on foreign policy and how to engage with radical jihadists would be. Uh, and when I looked at, I don't. When I look at it, I don't see anything inconsistent. What I see happening in Libya is is a, a is a is a pattern that I saw developing uh, early on with Iran carrying on and flowing through into Egypt, flowing on into Libya. Uh, and I would argue you could, you could see the same pattern moving over into our policy with Cuba, uh, where we have fundamentally changed the rela relationship with Cuba uh, and asked for no change in behavior on their part at all, uh, just believing that we're a different America and that uh, Cuba would view, it different, would view us differently, and therefore uh, we could come to uh, and make the kinds of steps that we've made in, in Cuba. I think there's a consistent foreign policy. Whether there's a corporate influence or not, I think that's, uh, that's ancillary. I don't think it's the core of what happened. All right. Okay. All right. That's a clear answer. Let's open it up to the audience and see who might have a question. Uh, we have a microphone in the back, and... Um, if those who would like to try and ask a question could identify themselves by name and affiliation. Okay. Well, let's uh, start over here, and then we'll work our way. Well, why don't you wait for the microphone a minute? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Chairman. I'm Elizabeth Ames Coleman, a former energy regulator from the great state of Texas up here now. And I've uh, gotten to know some Libyans and have been to the Middle East a couple of times, not to Libya. But uh, seeing as how there is still the vestiges of a civil society in Tripoli, and some outstanding men and women and, and lawyers, not that I 
-hmm. I think lawyers are always so outstanding, but um, you know there is has been a society, and they're trying very hard. There are some patriots there, Thank you. and I know you know that. And you know, I guess I'll have to read the book to get the end, <laughs> and I look forward to that. But just off the cuff, can you? What is your take on what we can do to put Humpty Dumpty together again and to help rebuild the, uh, the parts of industry and trade and commerce, at least section by section, in an attempt to back them up once now that we've cut and run yep. you know, and left them holding the bag, <laughs> so to speak? The, um, you know, I, I, I talk about one of the, uh, thank you for the question, I talk about uh, this a little bit uh, in the book, and it's one of the other lessons learned. If you break it, you own it. Um, you know, I think that was a, in s some other way, you know, th th that's stolen from Colin Powell. I fully admit that. Uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's a very wise insight. If you go in and, uh, you know, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's Iraq, uh, and, the, uh, and, and you break it, and you break it by taking out the leadership that's in place for whatever reason. Uh, as I described this to, uh, um, I was on Fox and Friends a, uh, a while back, and I was talking with Steve Ducey and Brian about this, and uh, I have to give credit uh, because Steve came back, because I, I was telling him I was writing a book about Gaddafi and, and these kinds of things, and everybody, you know, a lot of people don't know what happened for those eight years where he did almost everything that we asked him to do. Uh, they still remember this is the guy that orchestrated the shoot down of Pan Am 103. Uh, and you know, I, I take him through this, and he said, so Gaddafi was kind of the guy that kept the lid on the garbage can. All right? And it's kind of like, yeah, he really did. He, you know, the, the whole list of atrocities outside and internally uh, are very, very real. The, um, you know, and I think everybody, for me to stand here and tell you how to, how to nation build, okay, we've recognized that it is very, very difficult. But what you can't do is you can't go into Libya, facilitate the removal of the governing regime, which has brought the discipline and kept the lid on the garbage can, uh, and then leave, okay, and leave. And so, you know, uh, and then once you've left, how do you get back in? Like I said, Libya is now at least three different sections and probably more if you take uh, into account some of the areas that are tribal. You've got the government in Tripoli, you've got the government outside of Tripoli, uh, and then you've got the, the ISIS controlled, and then you've probably got some parts that are just uh, tribally controlled. Uh, how do you put that back together? Um, especially, and remember, this is a country that is flush with weapons. All right. Now, the good thing is it's not that many people. Uh, and they're all on a narrow band along the top of of the uh, of the country bordering the Mediterranean. Uh, so, you know, could you theoretically go back in with a stronger military presence uh, at the behest of of one of these governments? Yes. Do I believe and have much hope that the two groups that have been negotiating for an extended period of time uh, are actually going to reach an accommodation? I don't think so. All right. Uh, why? Because the what I believe is the group that is primarily domi dominated uh, by Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood in Tripoli, they benefit, and a lot of other people benefit from having chaos uh, in Libya. And they're not wanting the same types of things that we might want, which is economic development, stability, uh, and, and those types of things in a civil society. So uh, going in is, uh, is going to be You'd have to go back in with some type of a military presence and then recognize that it's going to be a long-term commitment, um, more than just you know, 18 months, 24 months, and those types of things. And whether the American people would, uh, uh, would support that or the Western Europeans, I don't know. But you're absolutely right. In the discussions that I've had uh, with you know, the Libyans uh, when I was there, with Libyans that I've met with, uh, since that period of time, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of good Libyans who would love to have a civil society and bring democracy and human rights uh, into Libya. And that that sometimes also is lost. Yes. Yeah, right up here. My name is Josiah Baker. I'm a microphone right behind you. Yeah. My name is Josiah Baker. I'm an economics professor at Methodist University. 
my question is, I'm looking towards the future, uh, you point to Hillary and, and Obama as being some of the root causes of the disasters we've seen in North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, what I'm very concerned about is, is uh, either uh, deep-rooted institutional corruption or deep-rooted institutional naivety found in the State Department, some parts of the CIA, where we have probably dozens if not hundreds of people that wrote very poor reports encouraging this administration. And so even if we get a new administration in that takes us on down a favorable route, we will have hundreds of these people that are still around that have either flawed thinking or they're willing to pander to whatever the moment is. And I'm wondering if there's any way we could hold these institutionals, these institutions accountable to, to fix this from happening again. The, um, <laughs> um, it's a it's a great question because I, I I mentioned in here at least uh, at least once the the flawed intelligence of you know the analysis of the people that uh, that we were going to be partnering with in Libya uh, the flawed analysis um, from uh, the director of the uh, the DNI director of national intelligence when he was talking about the Muslim Brotherhood and said you know groups like our Al Qaeda are going to have trouble competing against them because the Muslim Brotherhood provides social services and those kinds of things uh, and what we're finding is Al Qaeda didn't have to worry about uh, losing influence because of people who are improving society they had to, they have to, they're not worried about losing influence because there's actually a, a group that's more radical than what they are. Uh, and, you know, th that thinking does evolve out of the intelligence community. It does evolve out of the State Department. Uh, I think the other thing, and this is, um, you know, this, these institutions are held accountable by Congress is where the accountability needs to take place. And, you know, it, it's very interesting with the distrust, the dislike, and what some would say the hate that Amer the American people feel for <clears throat> Congress today, meaning what's the result? I think, what is it, 60, 60, over 60, maybe 70% <clears throat> of the Congress is serving in their first, second, or third term. Okay, it's like, wow. Uh, and they're great, they're, you know, they're good people, Republicans and Democrats, they're good people. But I can tell you, I, with the experience that I had after 18 years, and the experience of, voting to go to war in Iraq, traveling to Iraq on a couple of occasions at the specific assignment of Speaker Hastert, said, go over there and light a fire under those people and find those weapons of mass destruction, um, and visiting with the parents of the troops in my district who were killed, and experiencing that and going to their funerals, I would vote a whole, I, I would have a much different criteria for going to war and sending our men and women into war today than what I would, than what I did in, you know, 2001, 2002. Um, and being, being a newer member of Congress, <clears throat> the, it is a, amazing the trust that you put into these institutions some of which is not very well founded, all right? Um, and so, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be ruthless and aggressive uh, in terms of going after these institutions and holding them accountable. Uh, and you can go through a whole litany of, of things perhaps in the Bush administration and this administration where I think there have been outright total abuses uh, and the system, whether it's Congress and or uh, the Justice Department, unwilling to hold people accountable, maybe number one, for breaking the law, but number two, for uh, making bad policy uh, decisions and advice. And so, and especially in foreign policy, uh, one of the other things is I talk about it, foreign policy is hard, all right? And the focus on foreign policy is <clears throat> the American people, we have to give, we have to give our policymakers room to admit that they made a mistake. 
and then what we have to hold them accountable for, both them and the bureaucracies, is that they will actually learn from their mistakes so that we won't repeat it. The disappointing thing about Libya is we never applied the lessons from Iraq to Libya. And the only fundamental difference is in Saddam, we have removed what we perceived as an enemy to the United States. In Libya, we removed someone who we, many of us perceived at least as being an imperfect ally. But we didn't apply any of the lessons. We broke it, and we left, and we expected it to become a perfect country, and it became chaos. Does that sound familiar? Has that happened anywhere else in the last 15 years? where we go in and we remove a government um, and it doesn't quite pan out the way that we want it to. And, it, and the trouble with Libya is this is after we flooded it with weapons, um, training, uh, and per capita one of the largest contributors to the jihadist movement in the world. The, the, the irony here is think about this. What will, what will our allies or potential allies learn about engaging with the United States. Anybody remember when Osama bin Laden was killed? Anybody know when? Twenty eleven. May twenty eleven. I was I was I was in London and turned on the TV and you see all these celebrations going on. It's kind of like here I am. I've been waiting for this for. You know, for almost 10 years, and, and I, I'm, not par, I'm not in the U.S. When did Gaddafi die? October 2011. For doing everything that he was asked to do by the United States, he lived six months longer than Osama bin Laden. What's the lesson learned, not by us, but what's the lessons learned by those who perhaps want to partner with us in the future? Don't. Well, that's your analysis. Don't. <laughs> yes. Uh, are there, there are other reasonable people who would reach the same conclusion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really a scary thought. Mubarak, who, again, I bring up. And these were, you know, the other lesson in the book is in, in the world of four, I mean, I, I Woke up one morning on Sunday morning, every, you know, you get your parade magazine, and some days they would, some, one Sunday, you know, usually once a year, they'd have like the 20 worst dictators in the world, okay, Assad, Musharraf, Karimov, uh, Putin, and, you know, yeah, I always used to look at it just kind of interest. Uh, and one Sunday morning, I saw it, and it's kind of like, oh, I met with him. I met with him, and all of, all of a sudden, I've crossed out about you know eight or nine boxes of the twenty, and said, "Oh, I've met with them." Um, and in some ways, some of these people were real allies to the U.S. in terms of helping us in some of our endeavors. And what you learn is so often in foreign policy, it's not black and white. Uh, you've got to make some very very difficult decisions about who you're going to engage with and who you're not going to engage with in terms of achieving what you see as your long-term foreign policy goals. Yeah. I'm a retired uh, DOD employee, but I'm kind of curious, um, based on the example of uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq, uh, what do you think is the proper solution in Syria with Assad? The, um, well, I think I think the um, I think the proper solution where you, <laughs> Syria is hard. All right, I mean, you, you take a look at Libya, you take a look at Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and those you know they're difficult. Uh, and then you throw in Syria. Syria is hard. I think the path to fixing Syria is you need to first fix Iraq, uh, which I think is more manageable. Um, number one, you have to recognize that we are at war, okay? I just met with uh, a young special ops guy coming back from Kurdistan, uh, totally frustrated. Um, your DOD, uh, this is one of the things that I learned afterwards. Um, if we're gonna send our men and women to war, war is hell, but send them into war fully equipped and let them fight a war, okay? This is, um, you know, don't send them in with their hands tied, one hand tied behind their back. I, I met with a, 
uh, a father in, in, in Michigan uh, while we were in Afghanistan, and his son had, was serving in Afghanistan and just lost his best friend, uh, killed in action. Uh, they were going in, they were going to go to a village, and uh, they were in a valley, and uh, fire started coming down from, from the hillsides. And uh, they called in for air support. And the response was, we can't, you're close to a village and there's women and children in the village. And the guy said, you're, you're right. They're the ones that are running ammo from the village to the people shooting at us. Um, but yeah, we didn't let them engage in war. Uh, this young guy from, uh, from Kurdistan, you know, helping the, uh, uh, the Peshmerga, they've taken over 1,000 casualties. Uh, it's a country or it's a region of 5 million people. That would be the equivalent of the United States uh, having almost as many people as what we lost in Vietnam, 55 to 60,000. They are taking casualties. They are on the front lines. They're defending their, they're what, they're defending their homeland. Uh, they are outgunned because ISIS has U.S. equipment. Uh, that they gathered, that they claimed when the Iraqis fled, equip the Peshmerga, provide them training, provide them with close air support, uh, and have our special ops forces worth working with them. Do the same thing with the Sunni tribes. Uh, and they're, they're relatively optimistic that fully engaged NATO air power uh, training and equipment uh, on the ground, and they can take care of Iraq. Uh, in, in months, not years. Uh, so you start there. Uh, then you move in, into Syria, but with all the different factions and now with Russia uh, in place, uh, you know, I, you know that, that, that one is really hard. But again, what, what, what led to it? Uh, I met with Bashir Assad. Um, and you know, he, will, he would tell you that, uh, he told us back then his, his father killed what was it, 50, 60,000 uh, back in the 80s? Uh, and he would say, you know, Congressman, he, he would say, he said, Congressman, and he said this to the Codell, Congressman, we were killing radical jihadists long before you ever knew that they actually existed. Uh, now, there's some question as to whether they were radical, really radical jihadists or, you know, just people against Assad, but the, uh, it's a problem because, it, you know, these countries were all drawn with artificial lines. But I would... I, I would beg off your question by saying, let's fix Iraq first, uh, and then we've, 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 we've shrunk the problem a little bit, uh, and then take a look at what our options are in Syria. But, you know, per, you know perhaps the best option we've got right now, which is uh, an awful place to, uh, where we put ourselves, uh, but are negotiating with the Russians and the Iranians, uh, which is the path I think we're going to, and the, uh, the result will be... Uh, uh, Assad will stay in power. The worst thing we can do is what we're doing right now, uh, sending in 50 special operations folks for terms. Uh, I'm sure their uh, rules of engagement are both hands tied behind their back. Uh, and the other thing is that you will find uh, they're being rotated on 60-day shifts. How are you going to form the relationships have the continuity, understand the uh, what's going on, on the ground. One of the uh, one of the best experiences I had showing real commitment and understanding how you win a war was uh, going to Stan McChrystal's operation one night uh, in Iraq, uh, where he said, you know, uh, where you were, a lot of other people were rotating in and out. He said, I've been here. I don't know if it was three years at that point in time, but you know, I'm staying here until the fight's done. Uh, and it's kind of like, yeah, here's guy, and you know, and you're talking to somebody who really, really understood the dynamics and the nuances of what was going in Iraq. Why? Because he'd been there for three years every day involved in the fight, making mistakes, learning from them, and constantly improving uh, each and every day. And by, by the time we met with him, uh, really uh, gave you a high degree of confidence that he knew what he was doing and he was going to be successful. Great. Any more questions? Right here. One over yeah. here, my colleague Jim Roberts. Yes, uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, when the Obama administration led from behind to take down Gaddafi, they referred to an academic theory or a theory in foreign policy called responsibility to protect. What do you think uh, of that theory? The, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a, 
in, you know, the president was very eloquent. I think I actually highlighted or put the, maybe I didn't on the page for, I thought that might come up today, but the, uh, every, every indication and the claims, you know, the, the mass genocide, the killing and the raping and the brutality that this administration uh, was going to inflict on its own people uh, has shown to been uh, way overblown um, and not, you know, very little evidence that that was going to occur. There is no doubt that to put down the the rebellion, uh, the Arab Spring, or whatever, there were going to be uh, were going to be some casualties. But the I think that you know for for all of those that talk, <coughs> excuse me, for all of those that that talk about you know Bush lied, people died uh, with the weapons of mass destruction. I, I think you can make this for those who are making that argument. Although we went into uh, Iraq with a uh, you know a huge bipartisan vote in Congress. You could make the same argument about the president's uh, and the Secretary of State's claims uh, about the humanitarian disaster that was about to un unfold in Libya. Uh, there's no evidence that that was actually going to take place. I address that in the book. Uh, so the, you know the concept. There may be some <clears throat> validity to the concept applying it to what was going on in Libya uh, or what might occur in Libya, uh, it didn't apply. Okay, well, I think we're going to say thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. <clears throat>